We've all dreamed of visiting the Arctic and witnessing the natural wonders of polar bears frolicking on ice floes or the aurora borealis dancing across the sky. Well, sorry to break it to you, but you won't find any tourists flocking to Antarctica anytime soon. Why, you may ask? Let's dive into it. First off, where is Antarctica? It's located in the Southern Hemisphere, specifically at the South Pole. The Southern Ocean surrounds it, and most of the continent is covered by ice, making it one of the most remote and frigid places on Earth. Now, have you ever met someone who's visited Antarctica? Probably not. It's one of the least visited places on the planet, and only a handful of lucky explorers have seen its interior, which is mostly made up of glaciers and ice fields. But trust me when I say the wildlife and scenery are out of this world. Why shouldn't you travel to Antarctica? Well, for starters, the environment is incredibly fragile and can be easily damaged. Plus, there are no native human populations on the continent, so your travels would essentially be like visiting an uninhabited island. And let's not forget that it's also one of the most expensive destinations to travel to. Despite all that, Antarctica is not exactly guarded like a fortress, but there is an international agreement called the Antarctic Treaty. This treaty was negotiated to prevent any unwanted activity on the continent and bans some forms of testing done there by member states. But the primary reason we can't just waltz into Antarctica is that it has a delicate ecosystem that needs protection. The treaty states that Antarctica should be used for peaceful purposes only and should be free from any human activity that could harm the environment. Scientists are still learning about the continent's unique ecosystem and our activity and machines could disrupt the delicate balance that exists there. If you're still itching to go to Antarctica, getting permission isn't exactly a walk in the park. U.S. citizens, for example, need to complete a special form and send it to the Office of Ocean and Polar Affairs. And once you're there, you'll need to follow some strict guidelines to protect the environment, like not disturbing any wildlife or taking souvenirs like rocks, plants, or animals. Now, technically, can you live in Antarctica? While there are no laws banning people from living there permanently, it's a very inhospitable environment and unsuitable for human habitation. Temperatures can reach negative 76 degrees Fahrenheit and below, making it nearly impossible for anyone to survive without the proper equipment and experience. Plus, the nearest piece of land is over 1,000 miles away making any inhabitants completely cut off from the rest of the world. Who knows, maybe one day we'll get the chance to visit this unique and fascinating continent. But until then, let's admire it from afar. Let's now talk a bit about the discovery of Antarctica. Unlike other places that were already inhabited, Antarctica never had a native human population. Ancient Greek philosophers had an idea about the continent and called it Antarctos, meaning opposite the bear. The bears it refers to are not the polar ones though, but rather the great and little bear constellations, which are only observable in the northern hemisphere. As a result, the term signifies the opposite of the land of the bear. Whaling and sealing voyages in the late 1700s and early 1800s would venture further south when rounding Cape Horn at the tip of South America. It was known that going further south often meant stronger winds, but also the risk of hitting floating ice of all sizes and of winds and seas that could prove dangerous to the ship and crew. Captain James Cook was the first to cross the Antarctic Circle on January 17, 1773, in the Ross Sea region. He reached a point further north a year later, and though he didn't sight land, he came to within 50 miles and saw deposits of rock held in icebergs indicating that a more southerly land existed. The first sighting of Antarctica is widely acknowledged to have taken place in January of 1820 during the voyage of two ships under the command of Captain Fabian Gottlieb von Bellingshausen as part of a two-year exploratory expedition around the world to discover new lands. The captain's ships were the first to have crossed the Antarctic Circle since Cook. The first undisputed landing on Antarctica didn't happen until much later, on January 24, 1895, 
at Cape Adare during the whaling voyage of the ship Antarctic led by Henrik Bull. A small boat with six or possibly seven men on board rowed ashore during calm conditions. You might not believe it, but Antarctica is actually a desert. With all that ice, you'd think it'd be like a winter wonderland with snowball fights and hot cocoa all day long. When we think of deserts, we picture camels and cacti and people struggling to find water. But in Antarctica, it's a whole different story. The struggle isn't to find water, it's to find anything that's not covered in ice. And the average rainfall has been just over 0.4 inches in the past 30 years. That's like a few drops of rain compared to what we're used to. So technically, it's not the dunes or sizzling heat that makes a desert, well, a desert. It's the lack of precipitation. But don't worry, if you ever find yourself lost in Antarctica, you won't have to worry about getting thirsty. Just make sure you bring a jacket and some mittens because it's cold enough to make you into a popsicle. Not only is Antarctica one of the driest places on Earth, but it's also the coldest, the windiest, and the highest. <laughs> Talk about overachieving. The penguins and scientists down in Antarctica have at times found themselves in a bit of a pickle when it comes to time. You see, unlike the rest of us on this big blue planet, there is no Antarctica time zone. All the lines of longitude meet at a single point at the South Pole, making it a bit of a head-scratcher when trying to figure out what time it is. Now, you might be thinking, but how do the scientists and researchers keep track of time down there? Good question. They typically stick to the time zone of the country they departed from. However, with stations from all over the world on the Antarctic Peninsula, things can get a little wacky. Imagine trying to coordinate with your neighboring countries without accidentally waking them up in the middle of the night. You might think that not much could survive in a place where the temperature is extremely cold, the sun barely shows up, and the wind could blow you away faster than a tumbleweed. Well, as in many places on Earth, life found a way in Antarctica too. Believe it or not, this frozen continent is buzzing with activity. It's home to billions of krill, which in turn attract lots of seals and more penguins than you can shake a fish at. But don't let their cute and cuddly appearance fool you. Penguins are the ultimate swimmers, with streamlined bodies that would make Olympic medal winners jealous. They come ashore to breed and chill, but their real talent is stealing pebbles from each other and forming mathematically precise huddles to stay warm. Antarctica is also home to the largest species of penguin on Earth. It's called the emperor penguin. Sure, these creatures are flightless birds, but that doesn't mean they can't jump. In fact, some of them can leap up to 120 inches. And let's not forget about the seals. With their furry bodies and special songs, these marine mammals are protected by the Antarctic Treaty, and they're thriving in the cool waters of the Southern Ocean too. But the real stars of the show are the whales. During the Antarctic summer, these huge creatures show up in droves to chow down on the abundant krill. It's indeed like a whale buffet down there. Ever wonder why, despite all our advancements in technology and science, there's a vast expanse of our own planet that we barely know about? Believe it or not, over 80% of our oceans remain uncharted territory. It's as if we've got this massive aquatic playground in our backyard and we've barely scratched the surface. Also, did you know that only about 7% of our oceans have a special tag called Marine Protected Areas, or MPAs? How come this colossal body of water that envelops most of our planet is also among the most vulnerable and misunderstood spaces in the universe? Pressure has a lot to do with it. Our deep ocean is a beast of a place with no visibility, freezing temperatures, and pressure that's so intense that in certain areas it would make you feel like you're having the weight of 50 jumbo jets on your body. No wonder we're having an easier time sending people into space than to the bottom of the ocean. The deeper you go into the waters, the more pressure piles up. But let's not forget we have tech on our side, right? Scientists now use these cool satellite technologies that track the color of the ocean to check how much phytoplankton is there, for example. Why is this important, you might ask? 
because these little plant-like critters are actually pretty major players in our big blue oceans. In the grand scheme of things in the aquatic world, phytoplankton is like the bedrock of the ocean food chain. It gives life to almost everything, from the tiny zooplankton, which are animal-like microorganisms, to those colossal, magnificent whales. When these technologies first came around, satellites could get clear images of the ocean faster than a ship could take the same number of measurements in 10 years. But it's not all about looking at the ocean from space. Sometimes you gotta dive in there and see it for yourself. Thankfully, we've come a long way in ocean exploration tech too. We've got things like floats and drifters that ride the ocean currents while collecting data, and a whole fleet of underwater vehicles, some of which are manned, some remote controlled, and some even autonomous. Remember James Cameron, the guy who made the movie Titanic? He's super into exploring the ocean, and in 2012, he set a record by going down to the Mariana Trench in a vertical torpedo sub. He thinks there's nothing like being in the ocean and experiencing it firsthand. Other companies use a mix of technologies for their ocean explorations. It led them to discover amazing stuff like a deep-sea coral reef near Morocco, the only one still growing in the Mediterranean Sea. They've also discovered new species and documented ones previously thought to live only in the Atlantic. These efforts have convinced the local authorities to declare some places as marine parks. As with most scientific areas, the road isn't without its bumps. These expeditions can cost quite a lot, and the lack of detailed maps and data only adds to the challenge. We can't always rely on bathymetric information, meaning the study of the ocean floor, because it's often not available. And that's the tricky part. We need to explore more to know more. But getting the funds for these kinds of projects can be tough when there are so many unknown variables. One particular company's explorations have helped protect nearly 4 million square miles of ocean so far. The data they collect during their expeditions is invaluable. It's used to identify new species, locate vulnerable habitats, and even show where threatened species are being overlooked. Their work helps dismiss excuses from local authorities who claim they lack the necessary information to establish more MPAs. The same company supports a goal known as 30 by 30, aiming to protect 30% of our oceans by 2030. It's a big target and there's a long road ahead, but ongoing ocean exploration can provide the proof needed to keep more of our oceans safe. We also need to set aside areas for protection and research even when we don't have all the facts just yet. On that note, some cool scientists have recently stumbled upon a gigantic and mysterious world beneath the Pacific Northwest Coast's ocean floor. The best part is, this massive realm of life is pretty much cut off from the rest of the world above, making it like a secret underground club that only the best microbiologists have access to. Picture an active city. Except the city is microscopic cracks in the basalt rocks of our oceanic crust, and its residents are microbes. These tiny creatures aren't like you and me. They don't rely on sunlight or the organic products of land and water ecosystems for sustenance. Instead, they thrive on chemical reactions with rocks and seawater. Scientists call this type of life chemosynthetic which sounds complicated, but it basically means life sustained by chemical reactions. While this sort of life has been found deep in mines and around seafloor hydrothermal vents, the scale at which these creatures are found under the oceanic crust is unprecedented. It might even be the most extensive ecosystem on Earth. A geomicrobiologist from Denmark was part of the team that made this discovery. He claimed that over 50% of our planet's surface is oceanic crust, which is an average of 4 miles thick. Imagine the size of this chemosynthetic party happening down there. This discovery didn't happen overnight. Since the 90s, scientists have found weird tiny holes in the basalt rocks that make up much of Earth's outer crust. They seem like they might have been made by bacteria, but hey, there was supposed to be no life there. I mean, imagine trying to survive in a place that's hot, deep, dark, dense, and mostly devoid of the organic compounds we need for life. 
Yet, here they are. In the following years, more pieces of the puzzle fell into place. Scientists found that the oceanic crusts had different conditions at the centers and edges. At the centers, rocks are jam-packed with energy-rich compounds that support these tiny life forms. But by the time they reach the edges, these chemicals are all gone. Fast forward to now, and it's time to put the puzzle together. A microbial ecologist from the University of North Carolina worked on this research and says we now have solid evidence of microbial life in the cracks and crevices of deep ocean basalt. The next question scientists asked was, how far does this life extend? Researchers collected samples of crust from a plate roughly 120 miles off of Washington's coast, drilling deep beneath the ocean's surface. What they found down there was remarkable. The life down there runs on a unique fuel, hydrogen. Yep, in the absence of sunlight, hydrogen provides the energy for all their biological processes. These microbes use hydrogen to transform carbon dioxide into organic matter. This matter and other byproducts, like methane, then fuel other organisms, creating a network of life. Of course, the life down there isn't as complex as the one we know up here. Scientists doubt there will be any multicellular life under the ocean because it's too hot and energy poor. But hey, who knows? This universe under our oceans still has a lot to reveal. This whole thing is significant for many reasons. First, it confirms that life can exist in places without oxygen, which changes our perspective on where we can find life. This makes us wonder if life could exist under similar conditions on other planets where surface conditions might be too harsh. The implications on Earth are also profound. If a large portion of life exists in the oceanic crust, then our understanding of life on our own planet could be completely changed. This exciting discovery stretches our understanding of life and prompts us to keep exploring the mysterious depths of our oceans, pushing the limits of our understanding. NASA is also in on the whole deep sea exploration project. Why? Shouldn't they be preoccupied with outer space? Because they're hoping to find hints about what the oceans on other planets might look like. NASA specialists are really hopeful that by unearthing underwater secrets, we can solve some of the big questions about space. Plus, they're testing some nifty equipment for future journeys across our solar system. Many terrifying animals live deep beyond the waves, like this vampire squid living 3,000 feet below the surface in almost complete darkness. This animal has a cloak, like a vampire's. That's why it's called the vampire squid. Deep down at the bottom, it can't use ink to defend itself. So this animal has developed an unusual tactic. It glows slightly to scare away predators. If this tactic fails, the vampire squid can turn its body inside out, revealing tiny spikes. When you translate its scientific name, Vampirotuthis infernalis, it literally means vampire squid from the nether. Despite its terrifying looks, it's a harmless ocean animal. This previous creature was not from space, but this object definitely is. Before Elon Musk found a way to reuse rockets, NASA would simply drop old ones after launching astronauts into space, most of the time in the ocean or deserts. In 2012, Jeff Bezos launched a mission to find the Apollo 11 rocket. They found it by using sonar, but it was in terrible condition. It was sitting on the bottom of the ocean, not far from the predicted site. They were able to rescue the engine and reconstruct two of them. The most famous lost city is Atlantis, but sadly, we still haven't discovered it. However, Heraklion was also just a myth until one British pilot saw something that looked like a city while flying over the Mediterranean Sea. He reported it, and 60 years later, a group of divers went there. They were shocked when they found an entire city underwater. It was loaded with artifacts that could tell us a lot about the history of the place. Now it's one of the best underwater archaeological sites in the world. It's believed that the rising sea caused the whole city to go underwater. 
The Titanic sank in 1912. The wreck was claimed to be officially discovered 74 years later. In reality, though, a fisherman found the Titanic eight years earlier while fishing in the Atlantic Ocean. He was pulling out his net when he spotted a head stuck in it. Luckily, it was just a doll's head. Years later, after the fisher had passed away, his son sold the doll to a doll collector. She did a lot of digging and research on every person who had a porcelain toy on the Titanic. She found the owner of the doll. Ava Hart was on the Titanic and had a doll with her. Ava survived the catastrophe by a miracle, but her toy didn't. Hart even wrote about the doll in her journal, and every detail matched the toy found by the fisherman. The tripod fish lives deep in the abyssal zone, around 20,000 feet below the surface. It's adapted to such immense depths and uses its tripod fins to stay still on the bottom. This creature doesn't have big eyes, but even if it did, these eyes would be useless in the darkness. Instead, the tripod fish uses its fins like antennas to detect any movement in the water. This creature doesn't have much luck when it comes to its love life, so it had to develop unique tactics to reproduce. One fish can be both male and female. The next bizarre creature is the lizard fish. It has tons of razor sharp teeth, a huge mouth and really big eyes, which it uses for hunting. All this makes the animal look freaky. The lizard fish lives at depths of around 11,000 feet in the midnight zone where there is zero light. This freak of nature basically eats everything it can fit inside its mouth, from small fish to other lizard fish. On the other hand, when they see other reptile fish, they probably fall in love instead because finding mates at those depths is not an easy task. Like the tripod fish, the lizard fish can be both male and female at the same time. When you think of a river, you usually picture it on land. Still, nature is quite unpredictable, and it created a river flowing under the ocean in California. It's running at a depth of around two miles. This river has everything that an ordinary river has, sunken logs, trees, and rocks. And despite its uniqueness, it's not the only one in the world. There are also others in the Amazon and Greenland. A terrifying creature was discovered near Angola's coast by a remote operating vehicle. It looks like it doesn't have a head or a body. It was sitting at a depth of around 4,350 feet below the surface. After doing research, scientists concluded it wasn't anything from a sci-fi movie, it was just a cluster of siphonophores stuck together. In 2015, some random guy was diving in Caesarea, and something shiny caught his eye. He reached out, grabbed it, and realized it was a gold coin. After that, he examined the bottom and found out that there were many more. He reported the incident to the local authorities, and they concluded that he had found Arabic treasure. The coins were made of solid 24 karat gold and were a few thousand years old. But due to the perfect salinity and temperature, they looked brand new. The coins belonged to a ship carrying cargo. It was caught up in a storm and unfortunately sank. One of the weirdest things ever discovered was found in the Baltic Sea. It's an anomaly that looks as if it was created by a different civilization. It was discovered by Swedish researchers, and they basically had no idea what it was. They had to ask tons of other scientists for their opinions. When you look at this formation from above, it's 200 feet long and looks exactly like a fallen spaceship. It's hard to believe that it's a natural formation, but spoiler alert, it's totally made by nature because the Baltic Sea has gone through many erosions throughout history. Most likely, the bizarre formation is the result of these processes. A group of divers in Madagascar were shocked when they found this seven-foot monstrosity of a knife on the seafloor. The speculation started immediately, and many said that the knife was from some giants that had fought megalodons and lived on Earth 
thousands and thousands of years ago. That could make a nice story, but the knife is most likely a movie prop that was lost at sea. One of the ocean's most bizarre animals is the frilled shark. It's believed that this fish is the reason for all those sea serpent stories that sea explorers of the past wrote about. These animals live pretty deep in the ocean, but sometimes they can be seen in shallow waters. It's super rare, but possible. The frilled shark has a big mouth sporting around 300 teeth. It also has a long body that looks like a lizard's, and it is truly a unique species of shark. Its prey can be half of its size because this shark's stomach is like that of a snake, and it can swallow huge fish or crustaceans. Spotting a few worms in your garden is no big deal. But after seeing a 26-foot long one in the ocean, you will make your wetsuit a little wetter. This worm is super rare, and it's completely harmless to humans. It's actually not a giant worm. It's a cluster of zooids that are stuck together in a worm-shaped formation. They usually only eat plankton, bacteria, and other tiny things that can be found in the ocean. Probably the scariest thing in the ocean that is 100% real is the Magna Pinna, which can be found at crazy depths of 20,000 feet below the surface. This monster looks like an underwater slender man, but it's just a squid with really long tentacles that can reach a terrifying size of 8 feet. This guy has only been seen a few times, and basically, we don't know much about this creature so far. Look at that! What is that perfectly shaped ice circle doing in the middle of the river? How did it even appear there? For such a circle to form, the conditions must be very peculiar. So let's see if you can make a similar ice formation at home. Ice circles are also called ice disks and ice pans. They form in rivers, lakes, and creeks when ice gathers in the center of the body of water moved by an eddy. The thing is, random eddies tend to follow circular routes. And in the winter, ice crystals often gather in such slow-moving waters. As a result, they form circular disks of ice. The current doesn't let these disks move away, it just slowly rotates them in one place. As an ice circle turns, it hits other chunks of ice or the shore and gets lathed down until it's perfectly round. There's another way for ice circles to form. When a body of water gets covered with ice, a current traveling underneath might break off a chunk of ice and start rotating it until it's shaped like a circle. These disks can be really large, up to 50 feet across. Another amazing ice phenomenon is called penitentes. These are snow formations found at very high altitudes. Numerous and closely spaced, they look like long, thin blades of hardened snow or ice that point towards the sun. These icy spires grow over snow-covered and glaciated regions in the dry Andes at a height of more than 13,000 feet. Some penitentes are just several inches tall, while others reach 16 feet. That's around three human heights. Such jagged structures form due to the process called sublimation. It's a bit similar to melting, but in this case, the sun turns the snow directly into vapor without melting it first. In other words, the ice skips the liquid stage and goes from its solid form to gas. Curved areas of the surface heat up and sublimate faster than others, forming dents. That's how penitentes get formed, and that's why they lean in the direction of the sun's rays. Now, this is called rabbit ice. And isn't it cute? This phenomenon has other names too. Ice flowers, ice wool, ice ribbon. Pick whatever you like. I'll stick to rabbit ice. It forms when the air has cooled down to freezing temperatures. But the ground hasn't frozen yet. Sap in the plant stems expands while freezing, and it causes cracks along the stem. What happens next is water gets drawn out through these cracks. It freezes once it comes in contact with the air. This process forms super thin layers of ice, creating something that resembles ribbons or petals of ice. The same phenomenon happens with woody plants. But in this case, the ice is even thinner, more hair-like. These ice formations are incredibly delicate, so if you want to see rabbit ice, look for it in the early morning in shaded areas. You can find frost flowers floating on the surface of a newly frozen lake or sea. In 2009, a team of scientists from the University of Washington was sailing near the North Pole. 
That's when they discovered a large field of these pretty ice formations. But the best thing was that when they melted a few of these blossoms, they noticed that the water contained an unusually large number of bacteria. But how do these amazing ice formations appear? The air must be extremely cold, colder than the surface of the ocean, and very dry. When the air is so different from the ocean, its dryness pulls some moisture out of the water. The air gets humid, but just for a while. The cold makes the water vapor heavy. No wonder the air wants to get rid of this additional weight. So, crystal by crystal, the air turns back into ice, creating delicate flowers, sometimes reaching up to three inches in height. The ocean literally blossoms. Needle ice also has many names, and the most creative of them are frost columns, ice fringes, and ice castles. This type of ice occurs in a similar way to rabbit ice, but the water gets drawn out from the soil surface through narrow capillaries. All this water freezes in needle-like columns. At first sight, these formations look like baled hay, but made out of snow. And actually, it's quite an accurate description. You know how hay gets rolled up into large balls? Well, the same way snow rollers form. The wind blows a chunk of snow along the ground. As it rolls, it picks up even more snow, growing in size. Snow rollers are usually cylindrical and hollow inside because the very first layer of snow often flakes away as the roller moves. These snow formations can get up to two feet in diameter. They occur when the temperatures are near melting and there is a fresh layer of fluffy snow on the ground. Oh, and it shouldn't stick to the surface it lies on. Don't forget about the wind either. It should be strong enough to make the roller, well, roll, but not too strong to break it apart. These conditions sound rather precise. That's why snow rollers are so rare. But it's not only ice that creates amazingly beautiful things. Fire can do it too. Look at Pele's hair. These thin threads may look golden and pretty, but they're very dangerous to pick up. The wind sometimes catches small droplets of lava coming from active volcanoes. These droplets get carried miles away from the vent and are stretched into super thin glass wires, also called hair lava. Some strands can be as long as six feet. Have you warmed up yet? Then it's time to cool down again. On March 19, 2018, the inhabitants of Alabama had to run for their lives not to be hit by huge chunks of ice falling from the sky. It was the infamous hailstorm of Alabama which caused millions of dollars worth of damage. After the hailstorm, it looked as if the place had been thoroughly trashed by savages. Broken shop windows, smashed car windshields, broken billboards, and holes in roofs. But what made researchers really excited was a hailstone found near the town of Cullman, Alabama. This softball-sized monster was more than five inches across and thus set a new state record. Now, look at these pretty bubbles. They're pockets of highly flammable and combustible methane gas. Trapped underwater, this gas forms psychedelic landscapes and stunning patterns. Typical for northern latitude lakes, such as Lake Abraham in Alberta, Canada, these bubbles appear when animal remains, leaves, and plants fall into the water and get consumed by bacteria. These bacteria later excrete methane gas, but don't fall for the beauty of this phenomenon. When spring comes, the ice melts and the methane bubbles start to fizz and pop in a most amazing fashion. But if you happen to light a fire in the area, everything may go boom. Imagine surfing a perfect wave when it suddenly freezes. Well, it sure sounds creepy. Luckily, such things don't happen in life, right? Wrong. You can see mind-boggling frozen waves in Antarctica. These waves occur when the ice gets compressed and the ever-increasing pressure squeezes the air bubbles out of it. As for the beautiful blue color, it's the result of the ice melting and refreezing. And a bonus for you, frozen Niagara Falls. In 2018, the legendary waterfalls located at the border between New York State and Ontario, Canada, managed to shock everyone into silence. Tourists who arrived to admire the power of the roaring water were astonished to find Niagara Falls frozen. Jumping ahead of myself, the waterfalls weren't frozen per se, since such a feat is impossible for a mass of flowing water that huge. But microscopic water droplets that got airborne off Niagara Falls 
as well as the mist, formed a crust of ice over the rushing water. As a result, you could be looking at the waterfalls and be sure that they were frozen. In reality, the water kept flowing, but it was hidden beneath the ice. It was the beginning of the 20th century, and two rivals, Robert Scott and Roald Amundsen, set on their expeditions to become the first people in history to reach the South Pole. The race wasn't easy, and it ended tragically for Scott. Amundsen has won and set his tent on the pole before his rivals. A member of Scott's expedition known as Terra Nova, British geologist Thomas Griffith Taylor, not only survived the harsh conditions, but also made an unexpected discovery. He found a waterfall of what appeared to be blood at the rocky base of the glacier, which now has his name, in 1911. It took scientists more than a century to figure out what is behind the eerie coloring. A team of American scientists journeyed to Taylor Glacier with powerful electron microscopes to analyze its contents. Previous studies had scratched the surface of the Crimson Enigma, but no one had previously done a full-scale analysis of its mineralogical makeup. These researchers unleashed a whole arsenal of analytical equipment and spotted little iron-rich nanospheres. These teeny tiny particles, a hundredth the size of human red blood cells, originate from ancient microbes. They flourish abundantly in the meltwaters of Taylor Glacier. These nanospheres are jam-packed with iron, silicon, calcium, aluminum, and sodium, forming a unique composition that paints the subglacial water a vivid shade of red. These nanospheres don't have the usual crystalline structure found in minerals, which is why previous detection methods failed to spot them. Taylor Glacier's icy depths harbor an ancient microbial community that has thrived in isolation for thousands or possibly even millions of years. This discovery could help us in the search for life outside of Earth. Dr. Ken Levy, a research scientist at Johns Hopkins University, has some impressive expertise in planetary materials and the analysis of Martian samples. He decided to find out what would happen if a Mars rover landed in Antarctica. Could it figure out what makes bloodfalls so mesmerizingly red? So, researchers treated bloodfalls as a simulated Martian landing site. They used techniques inspired by the rovers exploring the red planet. The samples they collected were sent to Johns Hopkins processing facilities. There, Livy unleashed the power of transmission electron microscopy and revealed the enigmatic nanospheres. He made the conclusion that our current methods of analyzing other planets' surfaces with rovers fall short. They can't unravel the true nature of environmental materials, especially on chilly planets like Mars. These materials might be super tiny and non-crystalline, throwing off our detection methods. To truly grasp the essence of rocky planets, we'll need transmission electron microscopes. Strapping one onto a Mars rover isn't feasible yet, but it could mean a start of a new era in space exploration. Have you ever seen a waterfall on fire? Every February, when the stars align just right, Horsetail Fall in Yosemite National Park gets a sensational makeover. As the sun sets, its rays hit the waterfall at the perfect angle, transforming it into a blazing display of vibrant orange and red hues. We don't know exactly who and when discovered this natural miracle. The original valley dwellers may have known about it, but they kept it to themselves. It wasn't until 1973 that photographer Galen Rowell captured the first known photo of the waterfall bringing it into the limelight. Since then, the firefall has become a global sensation, spreading like wildfire on social media and drawing crowds from far and wide. This magnificent cascade draws hundreds of spectators every year, but they can only see the show under certain conditions. First things first, Horsetail Fall needs a flowing stream. If there's not enough snowpack in February, the waterfall won't have enough water to create the magic. The temperatures must be warm enough to melt the snowpack during the day. If it's too chilly, the snow will stay frozen and the fiery spectacle won't ignite. Second, we need a clear western sky at sunset. Those sunbeams need a straight path to hit Horsetail Fall and make it come alive. And since the weather in Yosemite is ever changing, clouds can magically clear up just in time for the show. If all the conditions are just right, you'll witness the Yosemite Firefall in all its glory for about 10 minutes. 
The mystery of the sailing stones in California's Death Valley National Park has puzzled scientists for years. Heavy stones seem to have a mind of their own and move across racetrack playa, a dried up lake bed. They leave behind a trail on the cracked mud. There were all kinds of theories to explain this phenomenon, from magnetic fields or dust devils, which are strong whirlwinds to mischievous pranksters. No one has actually witnessed these rocks in action, which only added to the mystery. In 2006, a NASA scientist named Ralph Lorenz entered the scene. He was studying weather conditions on other planets, but he couldn't resist the allure of Death Valley and those elusive sailing stones. He had an eureka moment while tinkering at his kitchen table with a Tupperware container. Lorenz filled the container with water, leaving a small rock poking out, and chucked it in the freezer. Then he placed this icy construction in a big tray of water with sand at the bottom and gently blew on it. The rock began to glide across the water, leaving a trail in the sand. Lorenz had been studying how ice can make big rocks float and move along tidal beaches in the Arctic Sea. Applying this knowledge, he and his research team figured out that, under certain winter conditions in Death Valley, enough water and ice could form to make the rocks float across racetrack playa in a light breeze. And as they glided, they left their mark in the muddy terrain. The River of Five Colors, Cano Cristales in Colombia, has the unofficial title of the most beautiful river in the world. For most of the year, it looks like any other regular river. The real magic happens between the wet and dry seasons when the water level is just perfect. This unique river floor is lined with a special plant, and when the conditions are right, it bursts into a dazzling display of colors. Think vibrant reds, stunning yellows, and lush greens, all mingling with the blue water. It's like stepping into a living rainbow with a thousand shades in between. This phenomenal display only lasts for a few weeks, from September through November. During Colombia's wet season, the river flows too fast and deep, covering up the river floor and denying the plant the sunlight it needs to turn red. And in the dry season, there's simply not enough water to support the vibrant life in the river. So you have to catch it at just the right time. The reason behind Maldivian beaches glowing in the dark at night isn't a mystery, but it doesn't make them any less impressive. It happens thanks to the bioluminescent plankton. These tiny creatures are like little underwater disco balls, emitting a cool blue glow when they are agitated or on the move. Imagine walking along the shoreline and leaving behind glowing footprints. You can even take a night swim amongst these magical plankton. Researchers have discovered that their bioluminescence is actually a clever defense mechanism against predators. When these microorganisms flash their little blue lights, it disorients and surprises their attackers. The plankton produces this light using a chemical called luciferin. These enchanting plankton can appear at any time of the year. The best chances of seeing them in all their glowing glory are from June to December. During this period, there's a higher volume of plankton in the seas of the Maldives creating the perfect conditions for a luminous show after the sun sets and the night sky takes over. You'll only witness the magic of bioluminescent plankton when tidal currents bring them close to the shore in large numbers. It's hard to predict exactly when this spectacular show will happen, so make sure to do your research and prepare to take photos with a high ISO to capture it, exactly like it looks in travel catalogs. The largest volcanic region on Earth is not in Africa or Japan, but under the ice of Antarctica. Scientists found 138 volcanoes in its western part, and if they decide to go wild, you'll surely notice it. They could melt huge amounts of ice that will move into the ocean, raise its level, and make our planet uninhabitable for humans. But before you pack your things to fly away to another planet, hear me out. Only two of the Antarctic volcanoes are officially classified as active now. And it would take a whole series of eruptions, decade after decade, to seriously impact the whole world. Mount Erebus, one of the two Antarctic volcanoes currently in action, proudly bears the title of the world's southernmost active one. It has been continuously erupting since at least 1972. It emits plumes of gas and steam and sometimes even spews out rocks and scientists call it strombolian eruptions. 
One of the coolest features is a lava lake in one of its summit craters, with molten material on the surface. Such lakes are rather rare, because they need certain conditions to make sure the surface never freezes over. The second active volcano is Deception Island, a horseshoe-shaped landmass. It is the caldera of an active volcano that last erupted over 50 years ago. Scientists who monitor it say it shouldn't go wild anytime soon. Antarctica also has plenty of fumaroles. Those are volcanic vents that release gases and vapors into the air. In the right conditions, they can spew out enough stuff to build fumarolic ice towers up to 10 feet tall. Scientists keep an eye on the Antarctic volcanoes with seismometers that detect when the Earth starts trembling from volcanic activity. Sometimes they also use more complicated tech, but it's all really challenging because of how far away this polar region is and how tricky it is to get there. That's why no one can predict when one of the continent's volcanoes that are now sleeping might erupt. We can guess what this waking up would look like if we analyze the events from nearly 20,000 years ago. So, shall we? One of Antarctica's sleeping volcanoes, Mount Takahe, had a series of eruptions and spewed out a good amount of halogens rich in ozone back then. Some scientists say these events warmed up the southern hemisphere. Glaciers started to melt and helped finish the last ice age. For these events to repeat, we'd need a series of eruptions with substances rich in halogens from one or more volcanoes that are now above the ice. It's an unlikely scenario, but since it already happened in the past, it's not completely impossible. As for volcanoes hiding under a thick layer of ice, it looks like their gases would hardly make it to the atmosphere. But they would be strong enough to melt huge caverns in the base of the ice and produce a serious amount of meltwater. The West Antarctic ice sheet is wet and not frozen to its bed, so this meltwater would work as a lubricant and set the overlying ice into motion soon. The volume of water that even a large volcano would generate in this way is nothing compared to the volume of ice beneath it. So a single eruption wouldn't make a difference. But several volcanoes erupting close to or beneath any of the western Antarctica's big ice streams would. Those ice streams are rivers of ice that take most of the frozen water in Antarctica into the ocean. If they change their speed and bring unusual amounts of water into the ocean, its level will rise. As the ice would get thinner and thinner, there would be more and more new eruptions. Scientists call it a runaway effect. Something like that happened in Iceland. The number of volcanic eruptions went up when glaciers started to recede at the end of the last ice age. So it looks like, for massive changes, several powerful volcanoes above the ice with gases full of halogens need to get active within a few decades of each other and stay strong over many tens to hundreds of years. Antarctica stores around 80% of all the fresh water in the world, and if they melted all of it, global sea levels would rise by almost 200 feet. And then we'd have to look for a new planet to live on. But this again is an unlikely scenario. It's more likely that the eruptions under the ice will lubricate ice streams and seep water into the ocean. But it wouldn't be the end of the world. A super strong, super angry supervolcano could do it, though. And it has already happened in the past. Over 200 million years ago, the world went through a major makeover with not one, not two, but four massive volcanic eruptions and huge pulses. The supervolcano called Camp had been erupting over and over for 600,000 years. It all happened in Rangelia, a large chunk of land that used to be a supermassive volcano stretching across what's now British Columbia and Alaska. And it wasn't the lava or the volcanic ash that ruined the environment. The eruption made carbon levels skyrocket. The planet would never be the same again. This volcanic activity might have helped dinosaurs grow from cat-sized critters into giants we saw in Jurassic Park. It kicked off a 2 million year rainy season. It made the whole world hot and humid. And the dinos just loved it. Researchers dug deep into sediment layers beneath an ancient lake in Asia to uncover these secrets. They found traces of volcanic ash and mercury, clear signs of those epic eruptions. There were carbon signatures showing huge spikes in carbon dioxide levels. It made the atmosphere toasty, and the rain poured down. So the bad news is, another eruption like this could happen. 
The supervolcano beneath Yellowstone National Park has been sleeping for nearly 70,000 years. But if it wakes up, it would be many times more catastrophic than the eruption of Mount St. Helens in 1980. It's considered the most disastrous volcanic eruption in U.S. history. It followed two months of earthquakes and injection of magma below the volcano that weakened and destroyed the entire north face of the mountain. The eruption column went 80,000 feet into the atmosphere and spread ash over 11 U.S. states and several Canadian provinces. The last Yellowstone eruption was a thousand times greater than that. The ground above Yellowstone sits on a hot spot made of molten and semi-molten rock called magma. This magma stuff flows into a chamber beneath the park, about four to six miles down, making the ground puff up like a balloon. But then, as it cools down, the ground goes back to its usual state. Volcano watchers have been keeping an eye on this for a century. They noticed the ground lift up about 10 inches around 20 years ago, but since 2010, it's been going back down. The experts say we have no big eruptions on the horizon, so doomsday isn't coming anytime soon. But there's some underground activity going on lately which keeps us interested. Since humans haven't been around to witness every little thing Yellowstone does, it's kind of tough to say for sure what's brewing down there. Yellowstone has had some epic eruptions within the last couple million years. They happen like clockwork, with gaps of six to 800,000 years between them. The last big one was around 640,000 years ago, and it basically reshaped the entire landscape, spreading ash and debris as far as Louisiana. You can still see the aftermath of the last big eruption in the Yellowstone caldera today. Experts say a massive eruption, like the last one, is an unlikely scenario. We're more likely to see eruptions of steam and hot water or lava flows. When and with what force it will wake up remains a mystery to scientists. There's not much to do in Antarctica except scientific work. You could check out the wildlife, like some cute penguins and seals. And you'd get to see the occasional whale swimming around. Antarctica is one of the biggest lands out there that's only inhabited by scientists and researchers from all over the world. These scientists dug a hole through some pretty thick ice to study the ancient air and how the atmosphere cleans itself. They used a special drill and dug a clean cylindrical hole 450 feet below the surface. Some of this ice can be up to 800,000 years old and is a good indicator of what the climate was like in the past. It's like checking out tree rings to determine how old a certain tree is, except it's more complicated than that. After the effortless digging, they decided to drop some ice to the bottom of the hole to see what would happen next. They heard some really unusual sounds. It felt like being on a spaceship traveling through a bunch of obstacles with many rocks smashing into each other. The pitches changed over the quick descent of the block of ice, ranging from high pitch and ending with a low heartbeat-like sound. The scientists were puzzled when they first heard this and dropped some more ice, only to find out that the same type of sounds were being produced, just in different variations. They couldn't tell what was down there and, more importantly, why these kinds of sounds were produced. Antarctica boasts quite a few volcanoes, many of which are under super thick sheets of ice. Scientists discovered 91 volcanoes and claimed there could be more, potentially making it the most extensive volcanic region in the world. While they were doing regular scientific research, they came across many unmistakable large cone-shaped figures underground. Some were as deep as two miles in the ice. Some of the peaks were over 3,000 feet tall and dozens of miles across. But on the surface, it's as plain as a sheet of paper. They may have dropped that block of ice inside an actual volcano that they were standing on, but it's unlikely. Even though the underground volcano presence was discovered by accident, there's a small chance they were actually standing on one where they had their workstation set up. It's more likely that they worked in an area where studying ancient climates is easier and less dangerous than other places. They collect ice samples and study them in a lab. It's like discovering a prehistoric insect embedded in amber millions of years ago when dinosaurs used to roam the land. But instead of little bugs, scientists study ancient dust, air bubbles, sea salts, volcanic ash, 
and anything else that may have come from the environment. They can practically tell how the climate was during that time. These ice samples might show that Antarctica's western ice sheet melted when the Earth's climate warmed up. If it did, then it's likely to happen again. That would mean sea levels rising, affecting coastal cities and small remote islands. But scientists aren't sure it's true, despite some evidence to back it up. The process of studying ice samples can take a week or even a year, depending on what they find. They crush or melt the sample bit by bit. And like those tree rings, the deeper the layer, the further we go back in time. In order to study ancient bubbles trapped in ice, researchers have to crush the samples under a vacuum hood to keep the air out while extracting the air and putting it in vials. There are various instruments and devices to study the ice samples, but because it's so sensitive to damage, each measurement must be in a clean room setting so that nothing gets compromised. The scientists have to wear proper body suits and many layers of gloves and constantly get ventilated. Even something as tiny and insignificant as a fingerprint can ruin a sample. They look for certain patterns to see changes in the atmosphere's composition and temperature. But dropping a few blocks of ice down a hole wouldn't be so bad. The reason why it made such a peculiar sound is the same reason why a moving car sounds different when it's honking than when it's stationary. The scientific word for it is the Doppler effect. It's an obvious change in the frequency of a wave with respect to an observer who is moving relative to the wave source. The effect doesn't mean the frequency of the sound changes, it just shifts. And this can be said about other types of waves, like water and light. But sound waves are the most popular ones when it comes to the Doppler effect. So, when the scientists dropped the ice block down the bottom of the hole, the sound waves traveled back up and bounced around the narrow tube where they drilled. That's why they got the pew pew sound. Let's not forget that this ice block traveled 450 feet beneath us. Oil ships dig holes in the oceanic crust that go thousands of feet beneath the Earth. The Kola Super Deep Borehole in Russia is the deepest hole ever made by humans. It goes more than 40,000 feet below the surface and took almost 20 years to reach 7.5 miles. Below it is only half the distance to the mantle. In terms of the whole Earth, this very deep hole is literally scratching the surface. This wasn't a hole to dig for oil and wasn't in the ocean either. The drilling was stopped in 1992 when the engineers found out that the temperatures were 100 degrees Fahrenheit higher than they predicted. And then it was abandoned, and it's just been a barren hole now. But that's the closest we've dug to the center of the planet. The scary thing is that some of the workers on the site could hear voices coming from within. All the way in Yemen, an ancient hole exists in Barhut, in the east of the country in the middle of the desert. It's actually closer to Oman than to the capital Sana'a. This hole has puzzled experts and locals. Unlike the holes in Russia and Antarctica, this wasn't man-made. Or was it? It's been around for many years, and the locals try to steer away from it. They don't even like talking about it, since they claim it brings bad luck to those around it or to whoever utters its name. They claim it was created as a prison for spirits, but many rule that out. The hole is 98 feet wide and somewhere between 330 to 650 feet deep. You can also hear strange sounds coming from the inside. But according to some scientists, the well has little to no ventilation and barely has any oxygen down there. So it's unlikely that anyone or anything lives down there. The Challenger Deep in the Mariana Trench caught some low-pitched grumble sounds in March of 2016. Some of these grumbles were followed by screeches. They caught these sounds in a span of weeks, using a titanium-encased microphone so that the immense pressure of the lowest point on Earth wouldn't crush it. They had to lower it slowly as well, since it's 1,000 times the atmospheric pressure at sea level. For 23 whole days, the microphone recorded typical sounds of whales passing by and boats sailing across from above, and even rumbles of nearby earthquakes. But they still couldn't determine what caused those initial sounds. The researchers couldn't understand if the noise from the bottom of the Mariana Trench was caused by humans or was natural. They also wanted to know if these sounds affected marine life, like dolphins and whales that rely on echolocation. 
they still can't figure it out. But scientists estimate that the ocean is about 10 times noisier than it was 50 years ago. With technological developments in shipping, submarines, and underwater construction, the ocean will only get louder with time. Northern lights come with sounds, which nobody talks about. They're usually audible when the auroras are at their most powerful presence. Scientists were always puzzled as to what caused the faint popping and crackling, even though they were very far above us. They used some special microphones and found out that the sounds came just 230 feet above us, which is pretty low. They're caused by electrical charges gaining power in a specific region of the auroras. The electrical charges are disturbed by magnetic storms that fire up the northern lights. As a result, some tiny sparks are released into the atmosphere, causing the faint crackling and popping noise. Antarctica is the most remote continent on the planet. It has 90% of the world's ice, but it's considered a desert because the annual rainfall is only about 8 inches. You'd probably never think it was a desert if you look at it, since it's white and full of wildlife. But Antarctica is not only what it appears to be on the surface. There is so much hidden beneath it, and even above it. Atlantis has long been a mystery for humankind. Did it ever exist? And if yes, where was it located? One of the theories supports that the Atlantean civilization could have thrived and flourished in the Antarctic continent when it was still uncovered by ice. Due to the Earth's cyclical eras, this is the periods of ice and interglacial periods. It was believed that Antarctica was actually a tropical forest. And, well, a recent Google Earth picture found some interesting ruins buried deep within a lake bed on the icy continent. It's unclear to which civilization these remains belong to, but some theorists believe that it could perfectly be Atlantis. And these frozen Antarctic lakes are holding much more under them. In the 1970s, scientists were surprised to find large lakes under the ice plaques in the frozen continent. Over 400 lake beds are believed to exist under layers of ice. Lake Vostok, for instance, the largest subglacial lake over there, is buried beneath two miles of thick ice. There are pristine blue ice caves hidden under there as well. The water in these lakes remains liquid due to the small levels of geothermal heat from the Earth's core. And some scientists believe that some lakes are around 15 million years old. Talk about the old days, huh? Now, amongst the unique phenomena that occur in the continent, let's say Antarctica is home to an extremely weird waterfall. The year was 1911 when Australian geologists wondered about the so-called Blood Falls. He was extremely puzzled by this red stream of liquid pouring from a small hillside amongst the Antarctic ice. After years of studying it, it was understood what caused the redness was the high iron content in the water. The last piece of the puzzle came when scientists discovered that there was an underground lake with water full of oxidized iron nearby, which was what caused the blood fall to exist in the first place. And speaking of puzzles, this image might be quite puzzling. After all, why on earth would anyone need to take cash to Antarctica? Well, a little history first. Back in 1956, the U.S. founded McMurdo Research Station, which is the biggest science hub in the continent to date. At its peak, the McMurdo Station hosts from 200 to 1,000 scientists. And these people need money to buy coffee, pizza, and other things to meet their daily needs. That's when Wells Fargo decided to install an ATM there. Oh, and they even set a Guinness World Record this way. The Wells Fargo ATM at McMurdo Station is the most southern one in the world. And it's the loneliest ATM in the world as well, as there isn't another one for hundreds and hundreds of miles. The freezing temperatures in Antarctica can make the continent hostile to human life. Actually, Antarctica is the coldest, driest, and windiest continent on our planet. 
The average temperature along the coast is around 14 degrees Fahrenheit. But as you head towards the Antarctic hinterlands, it gets even colder than that. The interior of the continent can register temperatures of around negative 71 degrees Fahrenheit. On the bright side, these freezing conditions can account for some mesmerizing phenomena, such as ice bubbles. These bubbles frozen inside some Antarctic lakes are bubbles of methane gas. The gas released from the melting of glaciers ends up freezing midway and makes for a beautiful and exotic scene. I guess methane never looked this pretty before, did it? A few years ago, scientists were taken aback by a giant hole the size of the Netherlands in one Antarctic lake. For scale, that's more or less the size of Lake Michigan. These holes are called polinias, and they are a natural phenomenon in the continent. However, this one is the biggest scientists have ever seen since the 1970s. So you'll understand, polinias are massive holes in a sea of ice. Most of them occur along the continent's coast, but this new one was found in the Weddell Sea, much farther from the shore. Scientists are still trying to understand how that happened and what its implications are for the climate in the region. There's one feature in the continent that looks completely man-made and has even sparked several theories around the world regarding its origins. I mean, this formation looks exactly like other man-made pyramids, doesn't it? The only difference is that this is actually a natural rock formation and has existed for a very long time. It was first found during an expedition in the 1910s and was kept secret ever since. It was nicknamed Pyramid, but its correct scientific name is Nunatak, which is simply a peak of rock sticking out above a glacier or an ice sheet. There are other famous peaks that look pyramid-shaped, such as the Matterhorn in Switzerland. So no, this really isn't a human construction, we're sure of it. And the list of fascinating discoveries on the ice continent goes on. An artificial intelligence program was analyzing a set of data on Antarctica when it came across a stunning discovery. There may be up to 300,000 undiscovered meteorites to be found in the icy field of the continent. The truth is, meteorites have been falling on the continent for millions of years. But it was only 110 years ago that the first one was found. And guess what? Recently, researchers found a Martian meteorite in East Antarctica. It was the biggest one found in the last 25 years, and it weighed about 165 pounds. Now, usually fire and ice are rather a tricky combination. So I'm guessing you wouldn't say that Antarctica hosts an active volcano, right? But it does. The volcano, known as Mount Erebus, is the southernmost active volcano in the world with liquid magma and lava boiling for eons. Actually, Mount Erebus has been active for over a million years, and it's Antarctica's second highest volcano with a height of 12,000 feet. We've mentioned before that Antarctica wasn't always icy, but could you imagine a huge rainforest covering the entire continent? This isn't science fiction, it's actually true. Leaf impressions and fossilized wood clearly show signs of tropical trees in the region. Fossil research has also revealed something magnificent. Antarctica is home to the oldest worm in the world. According to National Geographic, sperm fossils found in Antarctica reveal a long extinct species of worm that is around 50 million years old. Scientists claim that this discovery is beyond important to studying some evolutionary relationships and say that this was only possible due to the freezing of such samples for thousands of years. Antarctica is a continent rich in biodiversity. Penguins, polar bears, and seals are just some of the animals we know that exist down there. But there is also a rare and fascinating species of fish that inhabits Antarctic waters. Popularly known as the see-through fish, this species is as bizarre as it is beautiful. This fish had to adapt to survive the cold water temperature in Antarctica, so much so that it evolved into a unique being. As well as a transparent body, this fish has transparent blood 
making it completely see-through. This is because they lack the protein hemoglobin, which gives blood its red color. Pretty neat, huh? When you think of Antarctica, you probably think of icebergs, right? So here are some fun facts about it. Did you know that icebergs have a lifespan of about 3,000 years? And that together with Greenland, Antarctica is one of the world's primary sources of icebergs. Icebergs can reach 600 to 700 feet below the surface of the water, and around 90% of an iceberg is hidden underwater. That's where the expression, tip of the iceberg, comes from. Meteorites rain down on Earth every single year. Almost 63% of the 69,268 meteorites scientists have officially recorded in the Meteoritical Bulletin Database have been picked up from a polar desert. From where? Antarctica. It's technically a desert because it gets little precipitation. The continent receives an average equivalent of about 6 inches of water annually, mostly from snow. The interior parts are even drier. Not much action happens to meteorites there. Deserts are like safe storage closets for them, and it's easier to spot meteorites there. In total, there are around 42,000 meteorites in Antarctica. Most of them have been spotted since 1976. The Sahara Desert in Africa isn't far behind. Nomads and treasure hunters have discovered over 14,000 meteorites there, especially since 1995. Then there's the Arabian Peninsula, mainly Oman where they've unearthed about 4,200 meteorites. So why does Antarctica take the crown for its meteorite collection compared to other areas? It's not because more meteorites land there. Statistically, they can land anywhere. Antarctica wins because it's great at showing off these space rocks. The icy environment keeps them in mint condition. The contrast between the ice and space rocks makes spotting meteorites easy. Plus, there are spots called meteorite stranding zones, where the geology, ice flow, and climate team up to gather meteorites. Here's the sci-fi part. Satellites help researchers find meteorites. They use these space gadgets to spot the best places to search. Some of these meteorites are ancient, like a million years old. Now, when you think about how many meteorites there are, it's a bit like a pie chart. If you measure their weight, instead of just counting them, things get interesting. Antarctica's slice of the pie gets smaller. On average, an Antarctic meteorite weighs about 2 ounces, like a small bar of chocolate. Ooh, chocolate! But in the Sahara, they've got all sizes, so the average is about a pound. Now, let's talk about meteorites in action. Only a tiny bit. Maybe just 1.8% of all meteorites found have been seen falling. These are called falls. Clever name. Meteorite detectives, or meteoriticists, get all excited when they see that. The other 98% are finds. Someone stumbled upon them without seeing the meteorite take its cosmic leap. So when we only look at the ones that fell from the sky, most are called stony meteorites. These are like regular fellas of the meteorite world, but there's also a special kind called iron meteorites, or just irons. There are also super rare meteorites, called mesosiderites and pilosities, that are like a mix of metal and regular rock stuff. In places where humans live, like North America, people tend to find more iron meteorites than those that fell. That's because iron ones are usually bigger and more eye-catching. Farmers found some of these while they were working in their fields. Oh, a surprise! A bunch of gigantic iron meteorites from places like China, Namibia, and the US make the chart slices huge. Now, check out this adventure. A group of scientists braving the crazy cold of Antarctica's icy desert to uncover some fresh meteorites found what they had been looking for. In fact, one of the meteorites weighed almost 17 pounds. The ones like that are pretty huge. Do they have an impact on Earth? Science says yes, they do. Meteorite impacts are more common than you think. About 17 meteorites smack Earth's surface every single day. Since most of the planet is covered with water, there are loads of places without people around. That's why these hits often go unnoticed. Most meteorites are just small bits zipping through our atmosphere anyway. 
By the time they touch down, they get tiny thanks to all the friction against the air. Not all meteorite impacts are wimpy. Some supersized ones have rocked our world. Remember when dinosaurs said bye-bye? Yeah, that might have been the fault of a huge asteroid. These meteorite hits are random, and they happen all the time. Scientists have uncovered evidence of a massive meteor impact even before the famous dinosaur wipeout. This impact is thought to have triggered the biggest extinction event in Earth's history. The 300-mile-wide impact crater is chilling over a mile beneath the East Antarctic ice sheet. This mega-event occurred about 250 million years ago. The epicenter of the crater is in the Wilkes Land area of East Antarctica. It might have started the breakup of the Gondwana supercontinent. It was a big landmass that included parts of what are now South America, Africa, Antarctica, Australia, and more. So, the Gondwanda supercontinent started to chip off by creating a tectonic rift that pushed Australia northward. This Wilkesland impact surpasses the one that led to the dinosaur's extinction in terms of scale and could have caused catastrophic consequences at the time. The Hoba meteorite is a huge junk of space stuff chilling on Earth. It crash-landed about 80,000 years ago in Namibia. The thing is a heavyweight, like twice the size of the next biggest meteorite ever found. Interestingly, it also has a weird flat shape. Nobody's moved it since it fell, so we really don't know how deep it's hidden. But experts think it skidded along ground like a stone skipping on a lake because it landed at an angle. That's why it didn't leave a big crater when it hit the ground. And it was discovered by chance. A farmer found the world's biggest single meteorite. He was plowing his field with an ox and a regular plow. Suddenly, he heard a scraping noise. It was the metal plow meeting the iron meteorite. The Mosey meteorite from Tanzania has been staying underground for centuries before scientists gave it a proper look. The locals loved this space gem, calling it Commando. It was known in town for generations. Mosey is made of the same stuff as its other meteorite friends on Earth – about 90% iron and 8% nickel. It weighs 25 tons. Let's talk about the El Chaco meteorite, part of the Campo del Cielo meteorite crew in Argentina. Imagine an almost 24-square-mile playground for space rocks. El Chaco, weighing 37 tons, decided to show up fashionably late in 1969. So, what if you found a meteorite? How can you tell for sure that it's not just some random rock? These space visitors have a few features that make them stand out from regular rocks. Firstly, meteorites are often heavier than they look because they're packed with heavy metals and dense materials. Secondly, most meteorites have some metallic iron, so magnets usually stick to them. If you've got a rock that's not magnetic, try suspending the magnet from a string. The third clue lies in their unusual shapes. Iron-nickel meteorites aren't smooth and round. Stony meteorites usually have a thin, crispy crust on the outside. It looks as if their surface melted a bit while moving through the atmosphere. Sounds like pizza to me. Suppose these tips won't help on your quest. Then consider this. Light-colored crystals are not meteorites. Those pretty things, like quartz, are common on Earth but they don't hang out on other planets or moons in our solar system. Do you know those bubbly holes in volcanic rocks or melted metal slag on Earth? Meteorites don't have those either. Plus, scratching a meteorite shouldn't leave a mark. But if you scratch a dense rock and get a dark or red mark, the rock contains minerals like magnetite or hematite, which meteorites don't usually have. If you suspect finding a meteor in your backyard or something, Try these tips. Just remember, to be sure, you've got to give rocks and minerals a real-life look from experts. And if you see one falling towards you, always remember to duck. Do you know that NASA explores not only stars, planets, galaxies, or black holes? Hard to believe, but yes. The agency also works on discoveries here on our home planet Earth. So what has NASA recently discovered? Is there life under the ice? While they were analyzing data recently, they discovered something unbelievable hiding under Antarctica's ice. 
And this discovery not only changes everything we know about the whole water system of the Earth, but it may also help with research about life in space. Humankind's existence might depend on understanding Antarctica and its secrets. So, the recent discoveries reveal vital information about our survival. But before we continue, let's see how much you know about this place, where it's only ice as far as your eyes can see. Antarctica is one of the world's seven continents in the Southern Hemisphere. It's the fifth largest continent in terms of total area, and that means it's almost twice the size of Australia. Want to see real meteorites? Go to Antarctica! Due to its dry climate, Antarctica is one of the best places to observe space. But what's even greater is that you can find meteorites on the white surface of the continent. Scientists have already plucked about 45,000 meteorites from the ice, and they think they can see another 300,000. Since there aren't many terrestrial rocks there, it's easy for them to spot them thanks to their dark color. Antarctica's dry desert environment also helps preserve them, even the ones that fell to Earth more than one million years ago. And can you imagine any volcanic activity in Antarctica? It's hard. But this place is where fire meets the ice. West Antarctica is where most volcanic activity occurs. Scientists recently found that 138 volcanoes exist in West Antarctica alone. Wow! You would think that Antarctica is always cold, but no, its coastal regions can get as warm as 50 degrees Fahrenheit. But have you ever wondered what Antarctica would look like if there were no ice? It may seem unimaginable now, but it was not always covered by ice. That was 34 million years ago though, so nobody could tell how the continent's surface would be without the ice. But NASA changed that. They generated computer simulations and created the most accurate map of it as of today. What they saw was incredible. The continent was not flat at all like it seemed. It's pretty bumpy with valleys, rolling plains, and high mountains. But this was nothing next to what they had discovered under Antarctica's ice. So what is it? Drum roll, please. NASA found two new subglacial lakes. And what's even cooler about it is that they spotted these lakes from space. How is that? If your answer is high-tech satellites, then you're right. In 2003, NASA launched a satellite called IceSat. It measured ice sheet mass balance and cloud and aerosol heights. The satellite also helped create the ice-free map of Antarctica. In 2010, the European Space Agency launched the second satellite, Cryosat-2. It was for tracking the changes in the thickness of the ice. Then, in 2018, NASA launched the third one, IceSat-2, a follow-on to the IceSat spacecraft. It measured ice sheet elevation and sea ice thickness. It was NASA's most advanced Earth-observing laser instrument. It delivered the highest precision data. And when that was combined with the data from the other satellites, it was possible to spot these two new lakes near a pair of larger ones. But how is it possible that these lakes exist in the first place? The average thickness of most Antarctica ice is approximately 1.2 miles. However, it can get over 1.8 miles thick in some places, especially during the winter. So you might think that there's nothing under there, but science says otherwise. It's not quite possible to see it with your bare eyes, but the continent's ice is slowly but constantly flowing in different directions under the force of its weight. But scientists could not figure out how water moved for many years. That started to change in 2007, when data gathered from the ice sat provided insight into what hides beneath the surface. They first discovered an entire network of meltwater lakes connected under Antarctica's fast-flowing ice streams, and there were hundreds of them. Scripps Institution of Oceanography glaciologist Helen Amanda Fricker figured that the elevation changes measured by ISAT happened because of the dynamics of these lakes. They did not hold meltwater statically. 
Instead, they were filling and draining continuously over time through a system of waterways. And as they did that, the ice above rose and fell. But where do they drain? The ocean, of course, and it drains a lot. A recent study, co-authored by Fricker, found that the drainage of one lake flushed as much as 198 billion gallons into the ocean in only three days. Countless mysteries about how nature works are still waiting to be solved. But finding the two new lakes will give scientists a better picture of how fast the Antarctic ice sheet will change as the climate gets warmer and how this will affect global ocean currents and sea level rise. The filling and draining cycle of the lakes also caused the ice sheet to suffer cracks and crevices. So, the information they find from these new lakes will also give them a better understanding of the damage on the surface of the ice. They will also be able to assess how this filling and draining system influences the speed at which ice slips into the oceans and seas. And that means they can evaluate how the added freshwater may alter marine ecosystems. This discovery may also suggest whether life is under the ice. Wow! Scientists drilled through about 3,504 feet of ice and found that water samples taken from one of the lakes contained approximately 10,000 bacterial cells per milliliter. Such a high number of bacterial life is a good sign because that means the icy waters might also support higher life forms, such as microanimals, and one of these new lakes might even be their home. But the most exciting thing is that the new lakes might help them understand whether life on other planets is possible. Scientists believe any life below the frozen surface of the planet Mars might follow the patterns seen in Antarctica's lakes. So, there is a possibility that they might find critical new information on the type of life that may have existed on the red planet. You wouldn't want to be there during the winter, though. The lowest temperature on Earth you can experience is negative 128 degrees Fahrenheit. In 2010, there was an even lower temperature of negative 135 degrees Fahrenheit. And you may feel this cold much worse due to the strong and dry winds. Did you know that the size of the ice surface on Antarctica also changes throughout the year? It's about 1.2 million square miles during the summer, but when it's winter, it grows to 7.3 million square miles. Yet, despite the change, it remains the largest piece of ice on Earth. Sorry, Arctic, you lose. Do you know these cute little penguins? Consider these animals the locals, because there is no native population in Antarctica. It's a no-man's land, because no single country owns it. But do you know who really owns it? Five different species of penguins, seals, and killer whales. Ha uh -huh. Despite the continent's harsh conditions, you can visit it as a tourist for fishing and research purposes. Around 5,000 people reside on the continent during summer at research stations. But when winter comes, the number naturally drops down to 1,000. Antarctica's ice blanket makes up 70% of the world's freshwater reserves. Imagine what would happen if it melted. The global sea levels would be raised by almost 200 this just in, the world's oldest pyramid was built during the last ice age. And I'm not even talking about Egypt. I'm saying our ancestors might have spewed a 27,000-year-old pyramid in West Java. Ganung Padang is not exactly shouting pyramid. It's more of a mound with huge scattered stones tossed all over it. But local people seem to revere it, and they have for centuries. It wasn't until recently that the Indonesian authorities decided to excavate a bit deeper to see what all the fuss was about. They ended up finding the remains of a human settlement. It was rather unexpected, since the mound is pretty high up. This excavation could only prove there were humans in the area as far back as 45 BCE, which sounds reasonable. It was up to an Indonesian geologist named Donny Hillman to prove that Ganung Padang is the world's first pyramid. He used all sorts of new technology to support his claim. Our guy used carbon dating, which digs deep into the earth and takes whole chunks of soil. He found layers and layers of constructions, like he was digging up Rome and finding ancient buildings buried in the ground. His research proved that there had been caverns and even rooms down there, which could only mean one thing – humans. As for the rocks located up in the mound, 
they were most likely strategically placed by the people who lived there back in the day. They needed a place to meditate, so they arranged things in a harmonious way. Their smooth surfaces wouldn't be the result of years of erosion, but the works of great sculptures, the Michelangelos of their day, let's say. If this is all for real, then human civilizations began way, way before we think they did. Our ancestors, the Paleolithic humans, didn't have what it took to be considered a civilization, especially not the tools and knowledge to build pyramids. They needed a lot of masonry skills, which weren't all that available during the last ice age. His peers don't share this view, though. They could believe Hillman's theory if he had found evidence such as charcoal and bone fragments, but he didn't. Flint Dibble, another archaeologist, says that without concrete evidence of human activity, there's no proof of an actual pyramid. In this case, all the data proves is that the soil in the mound dates back to 27,000 years ago. He thinks the rocks on top of the mound just slip down the hill, like rocks normally do. Only a complex society would have managed to build a stepped pyramid like they claim it was. But according to Bill Farley, an American archaeologist, there's just no reason to believe there were any settlements in Indonesia during the last ice age. Now, just so you know, the oldest known ancient society with this kind of knowledge is probably 11,000 years old and used to occupy the region of modern-day Turkey. Take a look, Turkey's Gobekli Tepe. It's also not a pyramid, but it's the oldest monolithic construction made by humans. Back in the Neolithic period, a lot of people settled there, and there are proofs for it. For example, the walls there are covered in ancient drawings of clothing and wild animals. Until recently, the title of the world's oldest pyramid went to a three-sided construction known as the Djoser Pyramid in Egypt. Djoser is located just a few miles south of the Giza complex in a town called Saqqara. It made its way to popular culture more than once. In the 18th century, it became a common feature in European paintings. Young men from the cultural elite did a grand tour around the world, and Saqqara was at the top of their list. It was also featured in the video game Assassin's Creed, with a digital representation way more accurate than many historical drawings of the thing. That was kind of a big deal in ancient Egypt, to build pyramids for kings to spend their afterlives. And if you thought the Khufu pyramid was the oldest one in the world, well, Djoser was built 70 years ahead of that time. The development of new technology has allowed archaeologists to make groundbreaking discoveries, and a new, or should I say ancient, pyramid in South America might win the title in dispute. It turns out that pyramids were also pretty fashionable in the Americas in the old days. Among them are the iconic pyramids of Guatemala's Tikal Temple Complex, the same ones that appeared in Star Wars No. 4. But to find the oldest pyramid in the Americas, one would have to travel to Peru. Deep in the Peruvian desert, archaeologists stumbled upon a sprawling ancient metropolis known as Corral. At first, researchers believed that the settlement was pretty recent, since the site was way too complex for ancient technology to handle it. As we said, Corral is a desert town, like Las Vegas, but without all the hoopla. This means no easy access to water. And for cities like these to thrive, they need a considerable irrigation system, which leads us back to complex technologies. The Peruvians surprised us all with this new discovery. This site was huge, filled with an amphitheater, houses, and religious buildings. The whole thing probably sprawled through 370 acres. And when scientists went to test their initial hypothesis using radiocarbon dating, they found that the city probably sprung around 2027 BCE. On the site, archaeologists found six pyramids that could possibly predate the one in Saqqara. As far as they know, both civilizations coexisted in the same time period, in opposite parts of the world. But since researchers can't pinpoint the exact age of Corral's pyramids, it's pretty hard to guess which civilization completed their pyramid first. Hmm, if only we had a crystal ball. Now, it just so happens that the shape of a pyramid is something that nature is able to produce all on its own, leaving us modern-day humans a bit confused. A classic example is the Japanese side of Yaonagani, which also goes by the name of Japan's Atlantis. The entire monument is about the size of five football fields and the height of a five-story building. 
Explorers and scientists believe that Yanagani dates back to 10,000 years ago. For Japan's top marine geologist, Professor Mizaki Kimura, Yonagani is the heritage of a lost civilization. Kimura has dived into exploring the ruins over a hundred times over the past 10 years. To him, there are clear signs of human activity down there. Check out this triangular-shaped pool on the monument's surface. Kimura thinks it's actual proof of humans, because this triangle-shaped concave is a historical symbol of water fountains in the region. As it happens with a lot of these cases, not all scientists are convinced the same. For many, Yonagani is probably the result of thousands of years of erosion. And the fact that the monument is composed of one massive rock leads them to believe it is not really human-made. Sure, these huge basalt columns may look like the ruins of a palace, but they're most likely the result of the intense volcanic activity in the region. And speaking of natural formations that really look like a human made it, a pyramid on Mars has been a hot topic lately. Humans have been keenly trying to prove that there is life on Mars for quite some time. But some are stretching it really far, saying that little green or gray people built a pyramid on the planet to try and build their own civilization. This picture was taken over a decade ago by the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, the MRO. But it started to resurface recently. It shows what looks like a three-sided pyramid. Some people claim that the smooth side of the pyramid could only be the effect of otherworldly work. Mm. Then, science comes along and explains that Mars is home to one of the deepest canyon systems in the whole solar system. The so-called pyramid is located in what is known as the Kandor Chasma region. This Martian region has a bunch of similar formations that are nothing more than the result of erosion. Nothing supernatural going on there, apparently. <laughs>